This morning, I want to talk a little bit about how God responds when we fail, each of us, when we fail, and when we fail again, and when we fail again, and when we let ourselves down, and we let other people down, and we let God down, and we wonder if God can even think about us anymore, much less use us. How could he possibly forgive us again? How could he possibly have a plan for our lives with the way that we fail so often? And it's easy for me to think about this because I start with my own life and the guy I see in the mirror who falls so short of who I want to be and who I know God wants me to be. So I'm starting with the sinner standing in front of you. But a great way to think about that, I believe, is to look at the life of Peter and how he related to Jesus. For those of you who don't know, Peter was one of the disciples that followed Jesus. In some ways, he was the boldest. In some ways, he was the loudest. Uh, some ways, he was the most kind of committed to Jesus in, in more external ways, kind of obviously. He was the spokesman of the disciples. If Jesus asked a question in the Bible to the disciples, Peter was the one who spoke up. You know, he, he was the, the kid in class who had his hand up like this and, and wanted to answer. And you get the sense that it was earnest, that he earnestly felt something to Jesus. He felt a, a kinship, a desire. He wanted to please Jesus. He wanted to honor Jesus. He wanted to do everything Jesus wanted him to do. And his heart had a certain genuineness to it, a, a rightness of intent, you might say, a rightness of, of motive. You get a sense of, of real sincerity. And yet, like us, Peter never quite was able to do as well as he wanted to do. And the things he probably didn't want to do, he did. And the things he didn't want to do, he, he did do. And he fell short so often. But his relationship with Jesus, despite his failings, is instructive and inspirational for us when we fail, when we fall short, when we don't like the person we see in the mirror, or when we encounter people who look down on us and think that we don't have worth or think we're worthless or people who judge us or label us or put us down. The relationship between Jesus and Peter is more than instructional, it's hope-filled and inspirational. So I want to start with that and, and just a strange insight into the unique dynamics of their relationship. In some moments, Jesus admiring Peter and blessing Peter and complimenting Peter. And in the next moment, him saying Peter is the worst person ever and, and, and just condemning things that Peter would do. They had a, a unique relationship. And so I want to share with you this text from Matthew that you've probably never heard before in a message, both of these parts of the story together, because they seem to almost contradict each other. And so that'll get our gray matter going here as we think and pray through this together. A reading from Matthew chapter 16, and a great insight into how Jesus and Peter related, and, and maybe how God looks at us when we succeed and, and when we fail. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What, what's the gossip? What's the word on the street? What are, what are people saying about me? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and others say you're Elijah. Still others say you're Jeremiah, who's returned, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus, you just imagine kind of wheeling on them and asking them this great question. Maybe one of the best questions Jesus asked in the whole Bible. Maybe the question he would ask if he were here today and can ask each of us a question, each of us who, who take the name of Christ, if we call ourselves a Christian. Maybe the question, the most important question, a believer, a disciple, someone who wants to be a witness to Christ, the question that we should all have an answer for, we should all aspire, be seeking an answer for. Jesus turns on them and says, you know, basically, great, that's what other people are saying. But who do you say I am? Who do you Say I am. It's worth pausing, isn't it, to say, what would I say to that? What would you say to that? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter, of course, was the one who spoke up, right? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Hear this. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on you, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I don't know if Jesus is saying anything more complimentary or affirming of any human being in Scripture. Maybe one place where he, he blesses a, a woman who's washing his feet. But here, imagine the epic scope of this affirmation of Peter in front of the other disciples. What does he say? He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against you. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He gives him tremendous authority, tremendous affirmation of him as a leader. One verse away. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples what it meant to be Messiah. That he must go to Jerusalem, undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and three, be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus, began to correct Jesus, calling him down. All right, think about that. He pulled Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you, the crucifixion. Jesus turned on him and said, Get behind me, Satan. Now, wait a second. Five verses before, you are Peter, and on you, this rock, I'm going to build my church. I give you the keys to heaven. The kingdom of heaven are yours. You're my number one guy. This is a sad state of affairs. His number one guy is also being called Satan. He turns on him and says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wow. I mean, whiplash spiritually. One moment, Peter is the end all, be all, not only of human beings, but even of the disciples. He's the first. I'm going to build my church on him. By the way, that's the first time the word church is used in the New Testament. First time in the whole New Testament that the word church is used is right there in Matthew. This is a new thing. Peter might have been thinking, what, what is that? Ecclesia is the word. What, what is the, the, that I'm going to build? A, an assembly. He would have thought some sort of assembly. I'm going to build it on you, and you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then a moment later, when he starts to exert that authority that he's just been given by saying, well, first thing we got to do is protect you. Get thee behind me, Satan. Wait a second. That's total whiplash. When I think about that, I think about our relationship with God, Peter and Jesus as a parallel between us and God, and our ability to get it so right, and then in the next breath, to get it so wrong. Our, our ability to maybe be close to God, desiring God, hungry for God, and the next day have forgotten God totally, and be off to some other thing, wandering down some pig trail in our lives into something, and God not being a part of it anymore. Our, our ability to be a servant to someone in one moment and to be hateful or prejudicial or mean in the same day, maybe the same hour, maybe the same minute. And to think about how God relates to us, to us as people who are a mixed bag. Really? Well, that got me thinking about the greatest movies ever made, which, of course, you know, would be the Star Wars movies, right? There are only three real ones, right? Amen? All right? All right? Just like there's no designated hitter, all right? That's not real, all right? There's three real ones. And in them, you see a similar theme woven through it with regards to Luke and his father. And the mixture that is still remaining in Darth Vader, who we know and, and if this is a spoiler alert for you, I'm going to put you on the prayer list, okay? <laughs> like, pitiful, all right? Pitiful. <laughs> we, got, we got to work on it together. We'll start a small group. I don't know what, but we're, we'll do something. So Anakin is, is Luke's father who's turned down this evil path. If you haven't seen these movies, whew, that breaks my heart. But 
Um, God bless, bless your heart, bless your heart. That's what we say, bless your heart. And, but he sees in him that it's not that simple. That his father, yes, was seduced by evil and temptation and went into a life of evil. But his son, Luke, sees that there's more to the story. That it's not quite that simple. That his father isn't totally depraved, not totally evil. That there's still in him some inkling of good. I think of that almost in the context of how we're created in God's image. And so something of God, an imprint of God, an echo of God, a reflection of God, a, a shard of the divine being, a glimmer, a glimpse, a, a twinkle of, of God's goodness is in us. But it, it's wrapped up in, in the darkness that we do. It's twisted by the evil that we do. To where maybe sometimes all you can see is the evil. You think about Darth Vader, just this scary black figure, right? But Luke knew there was something good there. Jesus knew Peter was more than a get thee behind me Satan kind of guy. He was somebody that, that could be a powerful man for God. And so he wasn't ready to give up on him. So maybe you had not seen it. So I just want to remind you of how Luke saw good in Darth Vader. Take a look at this. Expecting you. I know, Father. So, you have accepted the truth. I've accepted the truth that you were once Anakin Skywalker, my father. That name no longer has any meaning for me. It is the name of your true self you've only forgotten. I know there is good in you. The Emperor hasn't driven it from you fully. That was why you couldn't destroy me. That's why you won't bring me to your emperor now. I see you have constructed a new lightsaber. Your skills are complete. Indeed, you are powerful, as the emperor has foreseen. Come with me. Obi-Wan once thought as you do. You don't know the power of the dark side. I must obey my master. I will not turn, and you'll be forced to kill me. If that is your destiny. Suit your feelings, father. You can't do this. I feel the conflict within you. Let go of your hate. It is too late for me, son. The Emperor will show you the true nature of the Force. He is your master now. Then my father is truly dead. When he says... It's too late for me now. You hear in that that he knows that he's on the wrong side. I mean, you don't say that it's too late for me now unless you know that something else might have been, something else could have been, that something else is better. It's too late for me to what? To, to fix this, it's too late for me to be saved, it's too late for me to change, it's too late for me to turn around. That's something you say when you know there's something right, something better, but you have given up on yourself. It's too late for me. I've had conversations with people like that who felt that way about themselves, that it's too late for me. I've gone too far, I've fallen too low. I've had folks who, who worshiped here before and when we had communion down front, a time to encounter God's forgiveness, told me they couldn't come down and receive communion because they weren't worthy to receive it. It was a joy to tell me, to tell them, you're right, you're not, but he is. 
He's worthy. I'm not worthy. Who, who is worthy to receive the grace that God has given us in Jesus Christ? Thanks be to God, he says to everybody, come. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so when I see this clip and I hear him say, it's too late for me now, I think about how perhaps we come to a point of despair with our own sin in our lives. That maybe we think this can't be fixed. Maybe we think I can't be fixed. Maybe we think I fail, I fail, I fail. God's giving up on me. God's given up on me. God should give up on me. Other people should give up on me. Or I'm worthless, I'm useless, there's no hope. And that's not the truth of reality because the gospel has shown us otherwise. I want to share with you one of my favorite stories in the Bible, which is also Peter and Jesus. Fast forward, maybe some of you know. Peter now, he's already been told he's the rock that Jesus is going to build his church on. Then he was told he's Satan, get thee behind me. And, and then Jesus keeps bringing him along, right? And, and then Jesus lays this truth bomb on him. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter, who was, you know, quick to say what he would or wouldn't do, said, oh, oh, I would never do that, Jesus. I would never deny you. Jesus predicted, they're going to ask you if you're with me. They're going to ask if you know me, and you're going to say no. You're going to deny that you know me three times. No, no, I'll never do that. I'll never do that. When Jesus was arrested, some people saw Peter near with the place where Jesus was being held and asked him, are you with Jesus? And he was terrified. He was scared he was going to be next. And so he denied Jesus. He denied God. Now I want you to compare that to whatever you've done wrong. Peter denied God. He had already defied God when he rebuked Jesus. Now he's denied God Denied even knowing Jesus. And, and then Jesus is crucified, and that's what Peter is left with. But the last thing he did before Jesus died was to deny him. Imagine the shame. Imagine the pain and the grief that Peter felt. Not long after this, Jesus seeks him out. John chapter 21 after these things, Jesus showed himself again. He's resurrected. And he showed himself to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, two other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But note, that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? Grown men love to be called children. Um, they really do. After not catching anything all night, <laughs> stranger walks up on the beach. Children, you have no fish. You know, the, the next lines really here are like exclamation point, pound sign, question mark, ellipses. You know, the little punctuation marks. They answered him, no. That's all the, they could include in the Bible. Um, it's been bleeped out. He said to them, and then he gives them some helpful advice, which I'm sure they appreciated. Hey, guys in the boat with no fish, cast the net on the other side of the boat, and you will find some. And then there's some more bleeped out stuff here. And then, so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there was so much fish. And we'll come back to that. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When, when the abundance happened, when the miracle happened, then all of a sudden they could see. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he who had been left with Jesus dying on the cross and his last thing denying Jesus three times, Simon Peter heard that it was Lord. He put on some clothes for he was naked and he jumped into the sea. And I think of that almost like a repentance. He's, he's turned away from his old way, the fishing, back to Jesus, the new way. And he's just running, swimming to Jesus. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about 100 yards off. 
When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. You can see the stories about Simon Peter. It's, everything goes back to Simon Peter, Simon Peter, Simon Peter. He went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of 153 fish. And there were so many, but the net wasn't torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And he's not just talking about food here, is he? Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it's the Lord. Jesus came and took bread. And you almost just want to go from there and broke it and gave it to them. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did that same thing with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now get ready. Remember that Peter denied Jesus three times. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? As if to say, do you acknowledge me? Do you claim me? Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter, totally missing the point of this, I believe, felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to, to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Without Peter even knowing it, Jesus offered Peter a second chance to affirm him three times where he had denied him three times. He had denied him, said, I don't know him, I'm not with him. And Jesus offers him three times to redo it. Three do-overs to affirm there before other people that he did believe in him and he did love him. And in so doing, he restores him. And then he gives this amazing authority to him, feed my sheep. Now just think for a moment, who is the person who's responsible for feeding and tending sheep. The what? Shepherd. And yet in John's gospel, this same gospel that we were reading from earlier, Jesus had said, I am the good shepherd. I care for the sheep. I call their name and they come to me. So think about the power of what Jesus is doing here, who has taught them that he is the good shepherd. And now he's saying to Peter, the one who had denied him, the one who he had said, get thee behind me, Satan. He's saying, tend my sheep. I put you in my place. You are taking my earthly place. You're the hands and feet, my hands and feet on earth. You tend my sheep. Tell the world you love me, and I give you this authority to tend my sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I make you my under-shepherd. I put you in my place. You who denied me, you who were a stumbling block, you who mess up at every turn, you who were so much like all of us, tend my sheep. Tend my sheep. What an awesome story of restoration that we have in this. And in it, you see, God doesn't give up on us the way we give up on us. And God doesn't give up on you the way you give up on you. Sometimes my family will laugh because I'll make a mistake around the house and I'll go, Wade, you idiot. I'll say that. I don't mean to say it out loud because that's probably a bad example. Uh, better than calling somebody else one, maybe. But if I mess up, what a blessing to know that God doesn't see it that way any more than I would say that to my own children. Ever, never would I do that. I'd rather die. God did die. He doesn't give up on us the way we give up on us. And maybe, just maybe, he's calling us to share that kind of grace with other people. Beyond that, it gets better. Did Peter seek out Jesus? In this story, no. Jesus sought him out. The one who had denied him, Jesus went to him. He, he goes seeking the lost sheep. When has he sought you out? When maybe you didn't deserve it or felt that way, but 
that's not how he operates. That's how we operate, to, to give up on ourselves and others and throw ourselves away or throw others away. Jesus sought him out to restore him. And he seeks us out today. And Jesus fed his disciples. Now, this isn't just about eggs and bacon, okay? Or fish on a fire. This is about how Jesus feeds us and sustains us today. He fed the multitude, didn't he? Who were hungry. He broke his body and fed the disciples. And here he is feeding them again, reminding them that, that they will be sustained by him. That they will be sustained by him. That he is the one who feeds us. Man does not live by bread alone, as Jesus said to Satan, but by every word that comes from our Father in heaven. He's telling us and showing us that the way to start our day is to be fed on Christ. If we want the day to be right, to begin by being fed by Christ, the one and the only one who can feed us. And he shows them that abundance and success comes when we act under his authority. Was fishing on this side of the boat different than the other side of the boat? No. No. Were all the fish on the west instead of the east? No. The difference was, was it being done under Jesus' authority? That when they did what Jesus directed them to do, the abundance came. And in your life, when you make a decision, when you're making a decision for your family, for your children, for yourself, for your finances, we're, we're seeing a picture of how that comes up empty when it's just done out on our own and we're just doing what we feel comfortable with, what's normal for us, using our own wisdom. These were professional fishermen, all right? They knew a lot about it and they came up zero, zilch, nada. Jesus says, no, do it this way. And when they accept his authority and do what he says, boom, abundance and success. Just because it was under his authority, just because it reflected his lordship over that one detail of where to put the net, and out of that came abundance. Hey, that's a roadmap for life. That is a roadmap for life for anyone who wants a full net. Wants a full net for their family, wants a full net for their children, wants a full net for their spirit? Is it under the authority of Christ or am I doing it my way, the way I think is right, the way I think is best? But the most important part of this, I think, is what we see going on with Jesus and Peter. Jesus holds something for Peter even when Peter fails. And back in the movie we were watching a minute ago, we see that same thing with Luke. And it's not maybe what we would think it would be that ends up being what saves his father. It's not accidental in the movie Star Wars, the original ones. There's so many Christian themes. If you're ever interested, we can talk about it. But in this part, you see the word save being used. That Luke wants to save his father. And what is it that saves him? It may end up being the same thing that saved Peter. Take a look. Luke, help me take this mask off. But you'll die. Nothing can stop that now. Just for once, let me look on you with my own eyes. leave you here. I've got to save you. You already have. Look. You were right. You were right about me. 
Tell your sister. You are right. Luke says to his dad, he says, he says, I can't leave you here. I've got to save you. And his dad says to him, you already did. You already did. You were right about me. I'm convicted that, that God holds that kind of hope for us. That he, he doesn't give up on us. And that maybe that's one of the biggest differences between us and God. Is that we give up on ourselves. And we give up on other people. But God isn't us. And one of the most salvific things, the things that save us the most, is when we realize in our heart of hearts that God will never give up on us. Never. Never. That he will pursue you with love and longing to the end of the earth. Seeking only to save you and me from ourselves. What a blessing it is to know he doesn't give up on us. And he uses unlikely vessels. Peter to build his church on. And that you and I like Peter, God will use Warts and all, because he sees the good there. He sees his image in us. May we be affirmed, and may you be affirmed, that God hasn't given up on you, so you shouldn't give up on you. And maybe, just maybe, there are certain times that we shouldn't give up on somebody as well. Thanks be to God that we have a Savior like that.